Good evening, everybody. Hello and welcome. Thank you all so much for coming um, to the veterinary team appreciation rounds here at OVC. Um, I do want to acknowledge thanks again uh, to our sponsor, um, Elanco, and Greg and Andrew, wherever you're sitting, way at the back there. Um, thanks very much for your generosity um, this evening. Um, again, thank you all for coming. Um, I also want to acknowledge our, our potential online viewers as well, so thank you for viewing. Um, so this evening, I'm going to present um, the topic of acute congestive heart failure, and I'm going to focus on some management strategies, specifically using case examples. I think the inspiration for this was um, a really hectic December, January, where I think I had just this massive onslaught of what felt like acute heart failure after acute heart failure. And you might think, well, yeah, you're a cardiologist. Don't you see this every day? <laughs> Stop your complaining. But um, I, I really felt like every little dog out there was collapsing in dyspneic, and, and they just kept coming. And it kind of, I guess, enlightened me to the fact that, my goodness, they were each individuals, and kind of the, the decision-making that I had to do with each one was... Um, again, very individual, and it, it sort of brought me back to basic principles. And it occurred to me that, you know, maybe this is something that you as general practitioners um, or, you know, other specialists um, might, might benefit as well, kind of this idea of just coming back to basic principles and, and looking at it from a, 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 a simple point of view, as simple as we can make it. And so in these case examples, I'm kind of focusing on you know, the meat and potatoes of, of our diagnostics and the very simple clinical parameters that we can focus on um, to evaluate these patients as we're treating them. So things that are very practical and easy to do and, and hopefully will make sense. Um, so in order to do that, it all does somehow come back to pathophysiology and we do have to do a little bit of um, background so we're going to go through a little bit of pathophysiology on acute congestive heart failure. That is, you know, a, a very simple definition. We'll talk about the classification of heart disease, um, which I think is, is relevant. Uh, a little bit on, on the etiologies that we're usually talking about in, in our small animals, just to bring some context to it, um, but we're not going to delve too, too deeply into that. Um, and then talk about yeah, what are, the, what are the therapeutic principles that we should be thinking about, and then how do we apply that to our, our clinical cases? And then we'll go through these clinical cases, and I've got anything from the very simple to the, the much more complex. So acute congestive heart failure, I think, can be defined as the rapid or gradual onset of signs of congestive heart failure that results in an urgent or unplanned need for veterinary medical care. So that's kind of what we're talking about. Those are the patients that we're talking about. And just as a reminder, if we're talking about left-sided congestive heart failure, which is the most common presentation that we would see, for that scenario, we're talking about um, a rise in um, pressure at the level of the left atrium. Just realized there. I don't think my pointer is working. Pardon me. Oh, I have a. I think I have a backup. Unless this is one. All right, so if we're talking about elevated pressure at the level of the left atrium, then what that is going to result in is elevated pulmonary venous pressure, elevated pulmonary capillary pressure, and therefore pulmonary edema. So I think we're all reasonably comfortable with that fact, and this is just a reminder that that's typically what we're talking about. On the other hand, certainly we do have um, cases that present with um, right-sided abnormalities, and sometimes even biventricular, which we will see in certain diseases. And so then we're talking about a rise in right atrial pressure, a rise in central venous pressure, and then finally ascites or, or pleural effusion as the manifestation. So, so those are the signs that we're talking about. In terms of classification of heart disease, I, I think, again, where it becomes important is that we can specifically tailor the diagnostics and therapeutics that are appropriate depending on the classification or stage of heart disease. So the idea is that heart disease happens along a continuum. And so these patients obviously, obviously go through a period where they have very mild disease, 
it is progressive, they are potentially asymptomatic for a chunk of time, and then they eventually become symptomatic. And kind of the first, I guess, official documentation of the classification of cardiac disease that we as, as cardiology diplomats have tried to adopt was in this document, um, and this was um, published in 2009. And this specifically is in reference to mitral valve disease. However, this can be applied to any cardiac disease regardless of the diagnosis. And um, so we'll just like take a look at that classification scheme. And, and specifically, these are, are the stages um, that they use to define these classifications. And this is um, adapted from um, what is used by the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology in Humans. And again, it's, it's trying to um, specifically tailor uh, diagnostics and therapeutics per stage. So stage A is basically the patient at risk for developing heart disease, but that does not yet have heart disease. So an example of that would be the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, who's at risk of mitral valve disease just by virtue of being a cavi. Um, the Doberman, who may be the carrier of the PDK4 mutation that places him or her at risk of dilated cardiomyopathy. So those are the, the patients we're talking about there. Stage B are patients that do have clinically appreciable um, heart disease on diagnostics, but yet that are still asymptomatic. So still free of clinical signs at home according to their owners. And then they are further subdivided into stage B1, in which case they have a normal heart size. So that is on a radiograph or echocardiogram, their heart size looks reasonably normal. They don't have the volume overload yet, but obviously you're appreciating something on physical, a murmur, a gallop, an arrhythmia, something to tell us that there's heart disease there. Versus stage B2, where now we do have gross evidence of heart enlargement, usually radiographically for most of us, um, in conjunction with um, this disease. Yet the patient is still asymptomatic. Okay, stage C and D, now we're getting into the symptomatic patients. So once they start exhibiting signs of heart failure, coughing, difficulty breathing, um, uh, perhaps syncope, now we're talking about stage C, and then stage D would be those that are refractory to standard therapy. So we've treated them with standard therapies, and now they are representing with ongoing signs of heart failure. So if we were to put that on a timeline, it looks something like this, okay? So once again, we've got those at risk, those that have heart disease but that are asymptomatic, those that are now in heart failure. And, and we're gonna focus specifically, pardon me, on these two stages. So we're talking about symptomatic heart failure patients that are either first time and or being managed with standard therapies or those that are becoming refractory to standard therapies. So that's where our focus is. If we think about the etiologies, who are these stage C and D patients arriving on our doorstep? I think that for our canine friends, uh, a large portion of them are going to be secondary to myxomatous mitral valve disease. And that's probably the grand majority of what you're seeing in practice um, with heart failure. So the smaller breed geriatric dogs, but even some medium and larger breeds as well, the grand majority of them, uh, we are talking about uh, a valve, a mitral valve that undergoes these degenerative changes. So specifically, there is an increase in the glycosaminoglycan component of the valve. Um, there is a fragmentation of the collagen and disruption of the normal collagen within that valve. And it results in these gross changes, these um, contracted, thickened, knobby looking leaflets that don't coapt well. Um, we can also have ruptured cordae. So here's an example of a little cordae tendine that's actually ruptured off of that valve leaflet. And then on a, on a histological level or a um, uh, even closer uh, microscopic level, they have um, denudation of their endothelial cells. So these are some little endothelial cells and we can see they've been sheared off on portions of the valve. It's not an inflammatory disease. Um, so this is, I think, what most of our patients are, are um, experiencing when they present with heart failure in terms of the canine world. But yet, we also have to remember dilated cardiomyopathy for our larger breed friends. Um, so our Dobermans, Neufs, um, Great Danes, and Irish Wolfhounds, just as a few examples, and lots of other larger breeds that we may see 
that have, rather than a, a primary valvular abnormality, have a primary myocardial abnormality. So this is a, a, a normal left ventricle here, wall and chamber in the middle. And here we have a very dilated chamber with very poor wall motion. Um, so this is a primary heart muscle disorder as opposed to a valvular disorder. Nevertheless, we still experience the same end result, that is congestive heart failure. And then finally, for, for our feline friends, uh, we are usually dealing, once again, with cardiomyopathy, although typically different, and I think we're probably all comfortable with the fact that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or HCM, would be the most common type of cardiomyopathy we see. Um, there are definitely pre, uh, breed predispositions, so Maine Coons and, and Ragdolls, to name just a couple, um, but we see plenty of cardiomyopathy in, in domestic short and long hairs as well. Um, so again, this is a primary myocardial disease. Now we're not talking dilation and systolic dysfunction. Rather, we are talking thickening of our left ventricle um, and therefore more of a diastolic or filling abnormality as opposed to a systolic pumping abnormality. So mitral valve disease, dilated cardiomyopathy in the dog, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the cat are going to be the main underlying causes of the acute heart failure presentation. Um, but again, the syndrome that any of those are going to result in really is, is very similar, and, and we have to deal with many of the same um, hemodynamic disruptions at the end of the day, because the heart only has so many ways to respond. Yes, there are obviously other congenital diseases that we may see, um, but I think patients presenting for heart failure these are going to be the main things we see, and the, and the congenital stuff is going to be more rare. So the common theme then, regardless of whether it's DCM, mitral valve disease, HCM, the common theme is that there is, at some point, a critical elevation in the pressure in the left ventricle in diastole. That's the critical, critical problem here. And I'm focusing on the left because left heart failure is, is more common. We could stick the word right in here, and, and we'd still be talking the same pathophysiology, um, but we're going to focus on the left. And, and the, the next result of that is that our left atrial pressure rises, and then our next step beyond that is that our pulmonary venous pressure rises, and then beyond that, our pulmonary capillary pressure rises in the lung, and finally, we have the development of pulmonary edema. So that's the common theme. Again, regardless of the underlying cause, that's kind of the principle of what's happening. So what exactly is the trigger or are the triggers for this sequence of events? And, and I think there's a number of possibilities that we may see in these patients. It may simply be progression of their underlying disease, right? So, so these are progressive disorders, and at some point that um, volume overload or pressure overload um, has to kind of overcome the body's ability to, to maintain stability, and they eventually tip into heart failure. So progression of their underlying disease is certainly one possibility, um, the natural progression. Sometimes we have failure to comply with medications, so we should always inquire with our owners about um, dosages and, and um, uh, frequencies and make sure that they are on the same page that we are on and that they are able to give their pets um, the medications um, that they need. Onset of a new arrhythmia, that's a common one for, again, tipping a previously stable patient into now an unstable situation. So we're going to be cluing in, do we have the onset of a new arrhythmia to account for this? Um, diuretic resistance, that's kind of an interesting one, and I'll touch on that. Patients that are on furosemide, for instance, long term, they actually do develop resistance or tolerance to that drug. And so some of these patients that have been on those drugs for a long time may um, become refractory to their effects. And then some other sure. scenarios that we might see, we might see patients that have concurrent disease that in some way disrupts their volume hemostasis. So diseases that can cause more volume loading, like hyperthyroidism, hyperadrenocorticism, um, anemia. Those are diseases that can increase blood volume potentially and disrupt a stable cardiovascular patient. Um, systemic hypertension, you know, obviously that heart has to work against increased resistance now, so that might be an issue. Um, and renal disease, by virtue of either 
again, disrupting volume status or, or causing hypertension. So th those are some things that we sometimes need to think about. And then in terms of the whole, um, I guess, deleterious um, phenomenon of heart failure, we know that there are some very distinct things that contribute to the onset of heart failure and the perpetuation of that heart failure state once it gets going. So the so-called vicious cycle um, of congestive heart failure. So we know there is a reduction in cardiac output um, by virtue of some underlying structural heart disease. And that triggers so-called compensatory mechanisms. Um, and that is that it triggers some neurohormonal systems to um, essentially upregulate to help maintain things like blood pressure and perfusion. So the sympathetic nervous system and the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, those are the two big players. They get turned on in the setting of heart failure. And their job is um, to create vasoconstriction to maintain pressure and perfusion and to increase blood volume, again, to maintain um, circulation and, and pressure. Now, that is a well-designed system for the short term, so hours, days in the setting of maybe hemorrhage or acute shock, um, but not a well-designed system for the long term and not intended to be for the long term. Um, but that's what's happening in our heart patients. And so those systems actually have deleterious effects in the long term. Things like myocardial necrosis, um, baroreceptor dysfunction, myocardial fibrosis, um, and, and lots of other effects that, that are going to be um, detrimental. And specifically, you know, vascular resistance or the work against which the heart must pump is going to rise because of vasoconstriction and an increase in blood volume. And evidently, a failing heart cannot continue to work against that increased resistance. So it actually triggers worsening of your myocardial function with time. So the systems designed to help maintain blood pressure and perfusion in the short term are not um, uh, conducive to the long term and are actually deleterious. So what are the... With, with, with all of this kind of mix of things going on, what are the things that we, we really do need to target when we are treating these acute congestive heart failure patients? We are targeting three main determinants of heart performance, okay? So we know that there's an increase in blood volume. We know that there's an increase in vascular resistance. And there may be some decline in systolic function or contractility. So those are the main things we're targeting, right? So we'll use the word preload. Um, so that's this curve up here. Good old Frank Starling. Have to come back to him. So these Frank Starling curves show us that as preload rises, so does stroke volume in the normal heart. So think of preload as what is the volume in the heart before it ejects? What is um, the wall, uh, I guess, stress in the heart in diastole? So as preload rises, cardiac output rises. What goes in must come out. But notice how in a failing heart that that curve flattens out quite substantively, such that a rise in preload, more in, you get much, much diminishing returns in what's coming out. And, and so that's how we get this back up in volume and pressure and congestion. So we do need to target preload to bring these patients from this flat part of the curve back to the steeper part of the curve. Um, because anything on the flat part is, is just going to make them more and more congested. So preload is something we're going to target. What else are we going to target? Afterload. So afterload is another word that we use for um, an increase in vascular resistance, for instance. So one, uh, I guess, um, surrogate for afterload is vascular resistance. Again, we know that there's all these systems turned on that vasoconstrict and increase the resistance against which the heart must pump. So we can see that in a normal heart, look what happens in a normal heart. As afterload goes up or as resistance goes up, stroke volume goes down. So cardiac output goes down with increased resistance even in a normal heart. And look how precipitously those curves fall off in failing hearts. So increases in afterload are really deleterious to failing hearts and they have difficulty pumping against that resistance. So we target afterload. And so preload, afterload, and contractility become our therapeutic targets. 
And how do we work that all together? So this is what it's all going to come down to. This slide, you're going to see this repeated. And we're going to work our way through this slide within our cases. And this is adapted from um, a paper in the human literature um, and, and from a technique, I guess, that, that many acute physicians might use to evaluate or assess acute congestive heart failure patients. And essentially what we are trying to do with every individual is make some assessment of are they congested and if so, how much? And naturally, because we're talking about acute congestive heart failure, the answer to that question is usually going to be yes, because those are the patients we're talking about. And how do we assess that? Well, we're going to look at a number of different um, easy clinical parameters. So are they dyspneic? Are they orthopnic? That is, do they have difficulty breathing at night or when lying down? Is their dyspnea positional? Do they have radiographic evidence of pulmonary edema? Do they have clinical evidence of pulmonary edema on our auscultation? What is our evidence that they have pulmonary edema? Do they have ascites? Do they have jugular venous distension or pulsation? All parameters to suggest that this is a congested patient. So those are the things that we look at for congestion. We also simultaneously want to assess their perfusion status. So what are some things that we can look at to assess perfusion? We're going to look at, whoops, I'm going backwards. We want to look at blood pressure, for instance. Do they have, are they hypotensive? Do they have a reduction in blood pressure? Or maybe even more simple than that, do they have a reduction in their pulse strength, their palpable pulse strength? Are they hypothermic? Are they cold? Are they lethargic to the point of being recumbent? And do we have evidence of worsening renal function? We can use renal function as one of those perfusion parameters. So we're trying to assess both congestion status and perfusion status. And then we want to slot our patients into one of these four quadrants. And for heart failure, we're usually talking about patients that are either warm and wet, in which case they need to be dried out. How do we dry them out? The main thing we're going to use is diuresis. No surprises there. But we're going to see that there's a number of different ways that we can use diuresis. There's, there's choices here. For the patient that's cold and wet, that's the other variety, they're more severe, they need to be technically dried, uh, sorry, warmed up before they're dried out. So that's that, uh, the kind of clinical scenarios we're talking about. And how do we warm them up before we dry them out? Now we're talking things like vasodilation, which might seem counterintuitive, but we'll see how that works, and positive inotropy. All right, so those are the main therapies we're talking about. And again, we see, we're going to see how diuresis, vasodilation, and positive inotropy, we are targeting, again, preload, afterload, contractility. It's all coming down to those three basic principles. So that's what we try to do with an individual and our clinical parameters and decide which therapies that patient needs first, second, third, for instance. Okay, so just a little bit about the diuresis, the vasodilation, and the positive inotropy. We're just going to talk a little bit about the drugs, and then we'll just zip into our cases. So diuresis strategies, as I, as I mentioned, it seems rather simplistic, um, but it is definitely the, the main thing that we do when it comes to a congested patient. It's often the first thing we do. Um, but there's choices here. So we have consideration of the particular agent. Now, I'm sure you will all agree with me. The one we're usually choosing is furosemide. Okay, when we talk more about maybe some more chronic therapies, then we may have more choice. But we have to think about the agent. We have to think about the dose. We have to think about the frequency of administration, the route of administration. And then sometimes we even get into combinations of agents. So the agents that come into play are usually our loop diuretics. So they're the ones that act here in the um, ascending limb, the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle, targeting this sodium potassium transporter. So those would be things like furosemide um, and also something called torsemide, which, which I'll touch on very, very briefly. Um, other choices, the thiazide group. Um, the, the main one that we use being hydrochlorothiazide. It acts more distally here in the distal proximal convoluted tubule. And then finally, aldosterone antagonists like spironolactone. 
Um, those are our agents that are going to work much more distally in our collecting duct, way down here at this mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist spot. So as you can see, depending on where that diuretic is acting within the tubule, that's going to relate to its potency, right? So the more proximal something is acting, the more potent it is. The more distal a diuretic is acting, the less potent it is, by, because by the time the ultrafiltrate has reached this distal portion here, much of the sodium and water reabsorption has already occurred. So the things that are more potent are going to act um, more proximally. Um, how many of you have, have gotten into scenarios where you're using things beyond just furosemide in terms of diuretics? Hands up for thiazides or spironolactone. Yeah, so some of you are starting to get into some of those therapies. And I'd also really encourage, like, if you have questions, just please shout it out. Don't be shy. So those are the choices we have for agents, typically. Dose, frequency, and route. You know, that, that seems, again, like something fairly simple, but, but it's not always easy when we have to pick what is the dose I'm going to use, how frequently am I going to give it, and by what route. So the agent that, again, we're usually reaching for is furosemide. Firstly, in the acute congestive heart failure patient, because it's the, one of the few that we have that we can give intravenously. Um, and, and its activity really does depend on renal blood flow, so we have to understand that. And one of the ways that you're probably administering it is as bolus therapy. So for bolus therapy, we are usually choosing doses for dogs on the order of 2 to 5 milligrams per kilogram. And for cats, we're usually on the order of 1 to 2 milligrams per kilogram. So less, less in the cat. And in terms of um, how do we administer therapy, for myself, I, I may be doing something on the order of every one to two, sorry, every one to four hours for the first two to three doses. So that's for a patient who comes in rather congested and who I feel might need multiple boluses. And then as soon as we see a reasonable effect, that is, we're happy that that respirate has come down, their comfort level with breathing is eased, then we're going to back off and decrease to something from anywhere every, to, every six to 12 hours, depending on, on how they're doing. So, so that's, I think, probably what you are most comfortable with, bolus therapy. And, and I think we've all been there, done that. But again, sometimes the choices of how much, how frequent, that, that can be tricky. And we'll see how that, um, that can affect an individual in our, in our cases. The other, um, I guess, means by which we can administer IV furosemide that, that we use not infrequently is a constant rate infusion. Has anybody ever done a CRI or a constant rate infusion? Yeah, I see some hands up. So those of you, especially in eMERGE practices, this might be something that you're, you're doing. And so th this idea of delivering, um, actually, let me just go back one slide. I just had another thought that I wanted to add. And that is the frequency of dosing. I, I think that, you know, we're all so um, entrenched with giving furosemide twice a day. But interestingly, it, it has a duration of action that is markedly less than that, in fact. And so what can occur is during those trough periods, there is avid sodium and water reabsorption at the level of the kidney. So you get these peak levels and good diuresis, and then as those levels are, are trailing off, there is avid sodium and water reabsorption on the rebound, on the upswing, um, and that can be detrimental. So in fact, delivering it more frequently with lower doses can sometimes be a lot more effective than bigger doses less frequently. So that's a strategy that we would frequently use. Lower doses less frequently instead of big doses, sorry, lower doses more frequently instead of big doses less frequently, which kind of brings us to this next idea of, okay, what if we could have constant levels at the level of the kidney? Might that be more efficacious? And there's still some controversy in people as to um, whether this actually translates into better outcomes for acute heart failure patients. Nevertheless, um, there is some sense that you can potentially achieve greater diuresis with this technique, so delivering constant low levels. Um, and you avoid that rebound sodium and water retention. It, it is sometimes preferred in the human literature if there is pre-existing renal insufficiency. So that's the other scenario where it might be used. And, and the doses we're talking about are, are typically on the order of anywhere from a quarter to one milligram per kilogram per hour 
you can see how on the higher end, that, that really adds up to being a hefty amount sometimes. Um, and cats, once again, we're kind of usually trending towards the lower end of that, given their sensitivity. And for a patient who's, who's pretty markedly congested and dyspneic, it wouldn't be uncommon for us to kind of start in the middle around 0.5. And that's delivered in, obviously we can't, we can't just deliver that straight, that's deliver, delivered in a crystalloid. And we tend to use for our heart failure patients often a half strength solution, so either half strength saline or PLA mixed with sterile water, half and half. And then we wanna give that in, in a low um, rate of fluid. So it doesn't make much sense to be putting it in and taking it out. Um, so we deliver it in about a quarter maintenance if we can get away with it. So that's another way that we'll see um, we use uh, a furosemide. So, so this idea of, of diuretic resistance, once again, we know that patients that are treated with furosemide long-term do develop resistance or tolerance to, to that drug. And so one reason why we may be getting these patients that are failing either their current dose of furosemide um, is because of this mechanism. And, and so what exactly is going on here? Well. One of the pieces of the puzzle is ongoing neurohormonal activation in a variety of ways. So we know that with the, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, it's usually um, the ACE enzyme that is responsible for conversion of angiotensin 1 to 2. However, and particularly in the dog, there are other um, enzymes that are involved in the conversion of ANG1 to ANG2, specifically the chymase enzyme. So there are pathways um, outside of or um, uh, in addition to the ACE pathway for production of angiotensin II. So we are, we are going to have that upregulated. We also have the fact that the sympathetic nervous system, we already said that that's upregulated, so that is going to continue to um, trigger the pumping out of renin. And then we also have some escape mechanisms whereby aldosterone is released from the adrenal by mechanisms other than just the RAS system. So that's going on as well. Other things that come into play, uh, what if our drug is just simply not getting there because of perfusion issues? Um, so we could have decreased delivery of our drug. Uh, we mentioned already the rebound sodium and water um, uh, reabsorption during those trough levels or the nadir of, of our levels. And then the interesting thing that happens is patients actually develop hypertrophy of nephron segments distal to where furosemide acts. So the cells in the distal proximal convoluted tubule actually increase their sodium and water reabsorption in response to chronic administration of a loop diuretic. So they kind of beef up their distal mechanisms. So how do we overcome these things then? Well, we can change the dose frequency to more frequent. So that's something we would frequently do. And, and some of this depends on can your owners administer three time a day medications, which I understand and recognize is, is tricky for some. Um, but I try to be a bit lenient. It doesn't have to be every eight hours exactly, um, but we try to increase the frequency. Changing the route, at least for a short um, duration of time, we'll see how that comes into play. Sometimes we combine agents. So that's where we're, yeah, adding another agent that acts at a different location so that we can have a synergistic effect. So we might add a thiazide or spironolactone and then adjust our furosemide dose, that is dial it down perhaps, to get this synergistic effect of the two. And then the final thing I'll mention is what about switching to a different agent entirely from our usual furosemide? And some of you may have um, read some literature already on, on another loop diuretic, torsamide, and you might wonder, well, how is that beneficial to administer something that's the same class? And it's simply that this, this may have better bioavailability, better absorption. It has a longer duration of action than furosemide. Um, it's more potent. And it also um, has effects on these mineralocorticoid receptors distally. So it's got more than one mechanism of action. So sometimes patients that are resistant to furosemide or have become resistant to furosemide may respond to, to torsemide. And there is some literature um, out there with some case reports of patients being treated with, with torsemide. I don't have any personal experience with it yet, but I expect that we're going to hear more and more about it and learn how to use that.
as time goes on. So stay tuned, because I think we'll learn how to use that drug better. Are there any questions or anything at this point? We've got just a couple more kind of pharmacology slides, and then we'll jump into the cases. So for vasodilation, remember we said we're going we're gonna to think about diuresis, vasodilation, and positive inotropy. Vasodilation, we're usually talking about either venodilators or arterial vasodilators, or perhaps a mixture of the two. So why are we using those drugs? Well, if we think about it, venodilators are going to be helpful to reduce preload. Okay, they're going to increase our central venous capacitance. They're hopefully going to help draw volume away from the heart and lung and into the high capacitance veins and drop our preload at the level of the heart and lung. Okay, and that's hopefully going to decrease the driving force for that pulmonary edema formation. So that's where they may come into play. Additional help with preload reduction. Arterial dilators, they're going to decrease that afterload or that systemic vascular resistance that we've been talking about. So if we think about this, recall that blood pressure is cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. So therefore, if we just shuffle that formula around, we see that cardiac output is blood pressure divided by systemic vascular resistance. So anything that drops our systemic vascular resistance because it's in the denominator, therefore cardiac output should go up. Cardiac output should go up so long as we are not simultaneously making them hypotensive, that is dropping our blood pressure profoundly. But in theory, if we decrease resistance, we should increase cardiac output and either maintain or maybe even improve blood pressure. So that's what we're trying to do with our afterload reduction or our arterial dilators. And what are the drugs that we are usually talking about? Well, venodilators were pretty limited in the pure venodilators. Nitroglycerin would be the most recognizable. And maybe some of you have used that in a paste or an oint ointment form. Have any, anybody using that? Um, for, yeah, some of the acute, um, especially kitties and things that, you know, you're kind of mostly hands off. Um, so some of those really acutely congested patients, sure, um, nitroglycerin paste or ointment might be very helpful in reducing preload. The arterial dilators that we're talking about, the pure arterial dilators, are usually something called amlodipine and or hydralazine. Those are two oral drugs, though. So... Um, what are some intravenous mechanisms? Well, that'll come down here in the mixed vasodilator. So mixed, they have activity both as venodilators and arterial dilators. And we have the very commonly used and recognizable ACE inhibitor group down here, so things like benazepril and enalapril. And then the other one that we have down in this category that's very helpful in, in an acute setting and in an intensive setting is something called sodium nitroprusside. It's another nitrate like nitroglycerin, but very potent arterial vasodilating properties. And you'll see the value in a couple of the cases on using um, drugs in this class. So amlodipine and nitroprusside, we'll see how useful that they can be in some of these cases. Um, so yeah, we've already mentioned nitroglycerin. Yeah, it's an ointment and we place it on um, cutaneously. And it's potentially useful both in, in cats and little dogs with myxomatous mitral valve disease where we may be limited in some of the things we can do. Intravenous nitroglycerin, we really don't have any um, experience in veterinary medicine thus far. Sodium nitroprusside, that's a drug that in the setting of um, uh, an acute care setting or an intensive care setting can be really, really helpful. And so one of my cases, I will show use of this drug um, it's a very potent IV arterial dilator. Uh, it does require uh, a constant rate infusion because it has a very ultra short duration of action. And we have to monitor blood pressure uh, continuously if possible with that drug. So we, we start it as, a, as an infusion, we up titrate it within a, a dose range, and we monitor our blood pressure continuously. Issues with it, it's light sensitive, so we have to wrap um, our fluid bag and all the lines in aluminum foil or vet wrap or something um, to decrease that light sensitivity. Um, other issues, it actually has the potential by way of its metabolism of cyanide toxicity with high dose or long-term use. Now that obviously sounds um, like quite a negative thing, and yes it is, but it's, it's 
I think, very rare in the doses that we're using it at and for the durations that we're using it. Um, so I have yet to see that happen, but in theory, um, that is a potential. But if we're using reasonable doses for less than 72 hours, it's unlikely that we're going to see anything like that. Um, so this is a drug that can be really useful in both dilated cardiomyopathy and, and mitral valve patients. And we'll see how. So lastly, positive inotropes. What are the drugs that we're talking about there? Um, probably the newest kid on the block, although it's not so new anymore, is, is pimavendan or vetmedin. And it's, a, it's an inodilator. So it's a positive inotrope and vasodilator. It increases contractility via calcium sensitization. And I think a lot of you have probably have experience with that, with that drug now. Um, but the other one that we tend to use a lot in, in the acute care setting is dibutamine which is a synthetic catecholamine. And again, it's going to be something that we're going to deliver as a constant rate infusion. It's going to be mixed in some fluid, and we're going to administer it within a particular dose range to effect. And that can sometimes be really helpful in our DCM patients. And so we'll see how, how that's going to be used. So these, both of these drugs have sort of slightly different mechanisms of action. Dibutamine um, is, is a beta agonist. So it's targeting beta receptors um, that are going to target calcium channels and bring calcium into the cell uh, to make those actin myosin bridges occur. Whereas pimabendan actually um, increases the sensitivity of the contractile apparatus to the existing calcium in the cell. So slightly different, um, but both very helpful as positive inotropes. All right, so that's kind of the background of, of the drugs that we're going to talk about. And again, we're focusing here on diuresis, vasodilation, positive inotropy, and how those influence preload, afterload, and contractility within that scheme of the wet, dry, um, cold, warm scenario. Okay, so our case discussions. Case number one was one of, I think, four schnauzers I had within the run of a month, and they were all collapsing and presenting dyspneg. So Shotzi was, uh, is, not was, is, a seven and a half year old female spade miniature schnauzer. And she presented in December of last year for multiple collapse episodes over the previous three days. I'm told I need to check my phone for tweets. Okay, I must be one of the few people on earth, seriously, that is not on Facebook and has never been on Twitter. Is anybody else in this room able to join me in that? Thank you, thank you, <laughs> okay. I don't feel like such a dinosaur. So she presented in December for multiple collapse episodes over the previous three days. And the collapse episodes were tending to occur with exertion. So sometimes minimal exertion. One time she was kind of running out and being a little crazy in the backyard, her first episode. But then the other times were more like just kind of going up the stairs kind of business. And she'd had progressive tachypnea and dyspnea that her owner had noted over the previous, previous few days. The other relevant history um, with her is that that was, that was not the first time we'd seen her. So we saw her back in April um, for the presence of a heart murmur that her referring had detected and had detected that it had increased in intensity. Um, so as far back as 2012, they knew she had a 3 out of 6 left apical murmur. And then they'd noticed that it was more along the lines of a 4 out of 6 in April. And they were a bit concerned as to what that meant for her. Um, but they were obviously working with a, a working diagnosis of, of mitral valve disease given her breed and age. And so we did see her in April and we did diagnose that she actually had moderate to severe myxomatous mitral valve disease. And we classified her as stage B2. So if we think back, those were our patients that had um, identifiable cardiac disease with cardiac enlargement but they're still asymptomatic. She had no clinical signs at that time, according to her owner, until she presented in September for a single collapse episode. One collapse episode where she darted out in the backyard, chased a squirrel, and um, fell over. It was very transient. She was up and at him within a couple minutes and completely normal and never looked back until December. Um, so here's where she presents with multiple collapses and also tachypnea and dyspnea. So on her physical, she's a seven and a half kilo dog, as I already mentioned. She's bright alert, pink, good cap refill. Um, on auscultation, we now have a palpable thrill um, on precordial palpation, I should say. So that gives us a five out of six left apex pansystolic murmur. 
She has a very regular rhythm, no auscultable gallop. Her heart rate is 150, so on the higher side. On pulmonary auscultation, she's bilaterally crackly. She's tachypnic. She's got increased effort. Her elbows are a little bit abducted. Her abdomen palpated normal. She had good femoral pulses, lymph nodes normal, and her pressures were actually pretty normal looking. Okay, so where does that lead us? So our diagnostic workup at that point, um, we did some what we call quick analyzing tests. That's what the QAT stands for. And um, she had a mild um, hyperlactatemia. So her lactate was 2.9, less than 2 would be normal. So perhaps indicative of some, some perfusion abnormality there. Um, on her full um, chemistry that her um, RDVM had, had done for us just, just recently, she had a mild increase in her ALP, which was historical and nothing new. Um, on a very quick focused point of care ultrasound, we didn't detect any pericardial or pleural effusion. Because of the history of collapse, we wanted to run an ECG on her, and she was in a normal sinus rhythm. And then we kept her on ECG during her hospitalization, and she actually had no arrhythmias noted on continuous monitoring for the duration of her stay. Um, and of course, the most important being, you know, what did her thoracic radiographs look like? Which I'm not going to show you. <laughs> so her echocardiogram... Uh, we actually didn't image her on that particular presentation, which is not uncommon, by the way. We saw her in September. We know what her working diagnosis is. So, so the role of echocardiography in, in this particular arena, it, it's not the most important priority on my list, um, with, with maybe a couple of exceptions. Um, but I'm just going to show you a couple images from her exam in September. Now, how do I make this go? Let's see if I can do this. I think I'll probably have to come over here. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So here's her gnarly looking mitral valve. This is a little schematic of the image we're looking at. So left side in the far field. So she's got a thickened mitral valve in this anterior leaflet when, when the valve closes, is kind of prolapsing backward into this left atrium. All the usual stuff that we expect. No surprises here. And then when we put color on that, yeah, she's got a decently leaky mitral valve. So at this point, we're presuming, okay, we have some progression of her disease, albeit we also have this history of collapse, so we have to kind of factor that in too. So her radiographs, I wonder, do I have control of lights? I think I do. I'm just going to see if we can make it somewhat darker in here without putting people to sleep. Whew. All right, so here's her radiograph. So I think our, our, our eyes tell us here that this is a tall heart. And I mean, thoracic radiograph is so critical to, to evaluating these patients. We have a tall heart. We have a wide heart as well. I think we can all appreciate this increased soft tissue opacity in this vicinity, which is the heart wear in a backpack. That's our left atrium. So we've got this backpack here that shouldn't be there. And we've got you know, some narrowing of potentially our bronchus which could be real or, or could be positional, but we certainly have a big enough left atrium here that we're wondering about it. If we focus on our pulmonary vasculature, which we like to focus on these pulmonary vessels up here, we can see that we have an artery coursing down here, and we have a vein coursing down here. And the vein, to my eye, tells me is fatter than the artery. So we do have pulmonary venous distension. Our pulmonary veins are fat. And then we have this lovely caudodorsal kind of increase in soft tissue opacity that's silhouetting with our heart and silhouetting with our vessels back there such that we can't make out vessels or aorta very well. I can start to see our caudal vena cava, but it's pretty white back there. And then on our DV view, some of these guys are so interesting in that they like to lateralize. And here's a good example of that. So if we focus on the lungs for a second, this left caudal lobe seems to actually be worse than, than our other areas. And we actually have the makings of a low bar sign here. If you can kind of see this sort of demarcation here where it's whiter back here and more lucent up here, that, that's actually the makings, the beginnings of a low bar sign. We're kind of tending towards alveolar back here. And then we've got some, some fat pulmonary vessels. This right here is a big fat pulmonary vein coming back caudally. 
And um, her vessels over here are a bit more difficult to make out because of our caudal vena cava, but there's a pulmonary vein right back there, and there's the pulmonary artery. And then her, her cardiac silhouette, she's got the lovely big left atrium here that's connected to our left auricle, which is over here. We'll actually see her post-treatment radiograph shows it even better. Um, but we've, we've got this caudodorsal increase in, in opacity and, again, pulmonary venous distension. So for us, that's, that's fairly diagnostic now that we have concrete evidence. Oh, forgive me if I don't get this right. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Back, maybe? Was that? I, I have no idea how it was, but we'll take it. Um, so we have concrete evidence now um, for stage C or, or congestive heart failure associated with our myxomatous mitral valve disease. So that's what we're treating. The other thing we have to keep in mind with her is we also have these syncopal events. So in the back of our minds, we're thinking, okay, why, why is she syncopal? Is it just that she's hypoxic? Because, yeah, she's terribly congested, and, and so is that what's going on? Um, does she have an arrhythmia that we haven't caught? She's having an inter intermittent arrhythmia. Um, could these events be so-called vasovagal, meaning um, she either has a surge of vagal tone or sudden withdrawal of sympathetic tone, which is something we commonly see in our heart patients, and that's causing her to peripherally vasodilate and become hypotensive and collapse. Um, the other thing we think about is pulmonary hypertension, which is something we can quantitate with echocardiography. So there's one role of echocardiography. Those events tend to be um, very exertional, and, and hers were not always with exertion, so maybe low on, on our list. If it's due to the former, this one up here, then hopefully by treating her heart failure, these events will go away. So where are we placing her with the data we know? with the data we have. So congested, you know, yes, we've certainly got our evidence of, of dyspnea and orthopnea. She presents that way. We have in clinical evidence of pulmonary edema. So she is obviously congested. How about perfusion? What indices do we have to look at that? Well, in terms of her blood pressure, it was normal. Her pulse strength is normal. Her temp did happen to be normal. She's not lethargic or recumbent. And on her chemistry, she had absolutely normal renal values. So I don't have a whole lot here to tell me that right now that her perfusion is, is terribly um, a big problem. Now, yes, obviously her cerebral perfusion when she's having those little collapse events is a problem. But moment by moment, walking around, she does not seem to be hypoperfused. So we're going to call her in the warm and wet category. We need to dry her out, and the main way we're going to do that is with diuresis. So here's a patient who is naive to all therapy, the best kind, naive to everything. She's just presented congested. She just needs a little diuretic, and hopefully she'll, she'll be A-OK. -okay. So what do we do? Well, in the very immediate term, yes, we give her a little flow-by oxygen, although she really didn't need that for very long. Um, and she got just a couple of, whoops, ah, there. She got a couple of IV furosemide boluses. She got two, two milligram per kilogram boluses. I gave them 30 minutes apart. I don't know why. I just wanted to go 30 minutes instead of an hour. I was feeling impatient, I guess. She wasn't, she wasn't turning around fast enough for me. So we gave them 30 minutes apart. Um, but then she actually had a pretty rapid response with that maneuver, and we actually backed off to every eight hours um, after that point. We did start her on oral pimabendan. If you, if you think way back to that one of those slides at the beginning, the consensus statement by um, all of those um, very eminent, preeminent experts that did not include myself, I have to say, because they're people much smarter and, and more reputable than myself. Um, but in their consensus document, they did suggest that with, with myxomatous mitral valve disease, patients presenting acutely for heart failure, that we should try to get that on board as reasonably quickly as possible, so long as they're eating, drinking, and able to take oral meds. So we did start that. And then we did have her, as I said, on continuous ECG monitoring um, to see if we could detect any arrhythmias. So the following day, we re-radiograph her, and we actually have a pretty nice result here. And if you like the kind of side-by-side -side thing, I think what, 
what um, we can appreciate best is that this caudodorsal area has cleared up reasonably well. It's, it's certainly not normal, but we can, we can make out this very um, prominent soft tissue opacity now that represents mostly left atrium. So her left atrium is quite big, um, but we can now make out vessels much easier and, and aorta and the caudal aspect of her cardiac silhouette. So that's just one day apart with a, a couple of IV boluses. And then here's our, our DV view. Here's again where I, I love this radiograph because we can actually see this kind of extra opaque outline of her left atrium and her left auricle here. Uh, and those, are, those are lovely findings, you know, very concrete evidence of a big left atrium. And, and that low bar sign back here is now gone. So if we compare, you know, that left caudal lobe that was quite um, opaque before has cleared up more. I'll just try. There's no rhyme or reason to whether these switches are up or down, by the way. That's why I'm confused. So there's the, um, the DV views side by side, showing some improvement in her lungs. And then if we just take a quick peek at some really simple clinical parameters, other things that we're looking at. So here's our pre-treatment and post-treatment, um, things like body weight, rest rate, heart rate, blood pressure. And what, what can we focus on here? Well, we can see her rest rate from um, her pre-treatment to her post-treatment. It's certainly come down. It's not normal, but it's come down. Her heart rate actually settled down quite a bit. Um, her lactate even, isn't that interesting? Just, just by giving diuretics and maybe one dose of Pymo she'd received by that point, um, you know, her lactate came down into the normal range. We didn't have a urea and creatinine the very following day, but we did have one um, not too long after in January, and, and her renal parameters were holding on just fine. Um, so this is our kind of simplest case scenario. You know, the simple scenario of a patient that's naive to drug, all we had to do is give a couple of doses of, of IV diuretic, back off as soon as we thought, hey, you know, her respirate's settling down, she's much more comfortable, re-radiograph her the next day, and, and we have actually a reasonably good effect. Now, the update to that story, though, is that since that time, I guess in December, um, she's, uh, she's given us a bit of a run for our money. Now, what we did, actually, we did send her home the very next day. So she went home that day those radiographs were taken um, on her oral pimabendan. We did start her on um, oral benazepril fortacore. And I think this, this speaks to... Um, you know, these medications coming into play speak to, obviously, the, the literature, the evidence that's out there to support that those two drugs have great benefit in stage C um, heart failure patients for the long term. And in the human literature, it's interesting. They suggest if there are therapies that we know are beneficial, try to get them started when they have presented in that acute scenario, unless there's contraindication, get them started because you don't know if you're ever going to see them again. And they may not get the benefit of that treatment, and that's what they find in people. You know, in people where ACE inhibitors and beta blockers are definite musts, mm -hmm. they get them started when they've presented, once they're stable for those acute scenarios, because they don't know if, if they'll be getting them back again. Yes, question. Uh, in terms of getting them started right away, yep. if you can't get blood work and aren't going to necessarily can't be confident to follow up with blood work, yeah, I, I think that it would be it would be common for us to not provide you know months and months worth and to provide a, a restricted amount worth. If they are eating, drinking, and feeling good, then I have no reason not to to prescribe that. Um, but yes, you're quite right. You know, we have to encourage them that here are the risks of any and all therapies. You know, we need to follow up with renal parameters. Um, we need to follow up with blood pressures and, and encourage them to do so. Yeah. Um, what furosemide dose did we choose in her? 10 milligrams. Recall she's a seven and a half kilo dog. So not a great deal. We, we gave her two milligram per kilogram in hospital, and we cut back uh, in terms of what we sent her home on, given that we were adding all these other things in. And then um, we were going to recheck her in two weeks and consider doing a Holter recording or an ambulatory ECG recording if she continued to collapse. 
Well, her story, I guess, we're going to jump on to case two, but I can tell you her story has, has morphed into the fact that she's, she's represented a few times with, with um, additional congestion. So this has not held her. We've had to bump up her oral um, furosemide dose. So that was kind of our first maneuver. Um, so we've done that in a, on a number of occasions. And it seems that kind of each new level that she, she reaches, she'll kind of cruise along there for a while and then boom, be back at our emerge with, with congestion again. So it really does beg the question, what, what factors are going on here to make her continue to have congestion? We're now at a point where we've added an arterial vasodilator. So now we're adding on therapies. So we added amlodipine. So she's now on amlodipine plus those other therapies to try to hold her. And, and her furosemide dose is now three times a day instead of twice a day. Um, and it's not 10 milligram anymore. It's more like 20 milligram three times a day. So we are having to ramp things up in that little dog um, for whatever reason. Questions about that one? Yes. And is she still presenting with episodes? Yes, thank you for asking. She has presented with single episodes. And interestingly, it is only every time that she has um, marked congestion on her radiograph. So in between, when she's breathing well and not dyspneic and not tachypneic, no collapsing. And it's only when she presents tachypneic and dyspneic that she has these episodes. So whether it's just you know, the hypoxia and pulmonary hypertension and the pulmonary vasoconstriction going on that's causing that, you know, that's, that's, we did halter her. She had no arrhythmias on her halter. Mind you, she didn't collapse while wearing it either, which is typical. Um, so I can't completely rule it out, but, but she had zero arrhythmia. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I did. Yeah, my first, yeah. Because she was on such a low dose of furosemide, given the dose range there and the ability to go to three times a day, yeah, our first maneuver was to push with more diuretic. And the amlodipine came in when actually her renal parameters are starting to get, um, get high. So we're trying to promote forward flow. And you'll see how that's going to come in in another case. The blood pressure, was, so we are not using the ACE inhibitor to treat hypertension. You are correct. That's not why we're using it. We are using it to decrease vascular resistance, so that whole afterload business, and to block the chronic negative effects of the RAS system. And, and I think we have pretty good evidence in both the veterinary, well, we'll focus on the veterinary literature first. So good evidence in the veterinary literature with the live trial and the bench trial back, you know, more than 10 years ago now, that ACE inhibition in congestive heart failure due to mitral valve disease or um, dilated cardiomyopathy improves survival. So I think we have pretty good evidence of that. Yep. So if and when will you add ozone? That is a great question. The next time she comes in with more <laughs> congestion and collapse. <laughs> no, truthfully. Depending on what their renal parameters are doing. So yeah, not always, not always. And yeah, potassium might factor in there too if, if they're tending to be on the low side and or we're having to supplement them, which she is not, by the way, but um, yeah, absolutely. And interestingly, I don't think we, we, we still do not have good guidance on when the right time to start something like spironolactone is. We don't have the literature yet. Now, in that consensus document, interestingly, for the stage D patient, so the patient who's on triple therapy, who's continuing to present with congestion, that is one of the maneuvers that they suggest. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. That's a loaded question, isn't it? Yeah, it would not typically be one of my first choices, no. Only because, as you say, we, we don't know what underlying disease we're dealing with. Just because the heart's big does not mean it's dilated cardiomyopathy. We don't have a diagnosis. Um, and I think we can have pretty good effects with diuretics and ACE inhibitors um, in, in a lot of cats. Yeah, it's a good question. It's tough when hands are tied like that, yeah. 
Okay, so we'll move on to Monroe. Schnauzer, two out of four. And Monroe's story is a little bit different. Um, he presented, however, much the same as Shotzi, that is coughing and gagging, although his history of respiratory signs was a little more protracted. Shotzi's was a, a little more acute. He'd been coughing and gagging for a few weeks. Once again, collapse. He'd been having three collapse episodes in the past two days. They were always post-coughing fit. So this dog would have a coughing fit and then have a very transient syncopal event and then very rapidly return to his normal coughing dysnic self. He had a decreased appetite. He'd been drinking more. Um, his primary care veterinarian did start Fortacor the day prior to um, the day he presented to us, thinking that that might um, indeed help his signs. And his, his past history was a bit interesting. Once again, he'd certainly had a chronic history of a heart murmur, so he'd been known to have a three to four out of six left apex murmur since, since 2010. He's 12 and a half years old, so fits the, um, I guess, the signalment for many of our mitral valve cases. Um, maybe less relevant is the fact that he had leptospirosis and pancreatitis back in 2006 and spent a number of weeks in our ICU. Um, but interestingly, in, in 2011, um, he was worked up for some bladder urolis, and therapeutically, he'd been receiving potassium citrate and hydrochlorothiazide twice a day for the past four years um, for, for his bladder urolis. So that was a bit of an interesting part of his history. Um, he was up to date on vaccines and, and heartworm prophylaxis. So I think his, his primary care veterinarian, you know, thought, He's already on a diuretic. Let's just try increasing that and adding Fortacor, see how we do. Um, but he continued to have some troubles. So on his physical, he was a little bit smaller than Shotzi, equally bright alert, pink, good cap refill. His physical was very similar in that he had a palpable thrill now over his left apex, so a five out of six murmur. Regular rhythm, heart rate was 144. He too had crackles um, on, on the left, he was tachypnic. He had a bit of a kind of palpably big liver on, on his um, abdominal palpation, normal femoral pulses, normal blood pressure. On his, his quick analyzing tests were all pretty darn normal. On his renal panel, um, which was provided to us, I think, from the day prior to presentation by his primary care veterinarian, he came to us with already an increase in his urea. And we thought, okay, how much of this is he's been on hydrochlorothiazide for the past four years versus, you know, how much of this is actually truly renal? So is this just pre-renal or renal? His creatinine was absolutely normal. Um, by the way, these are um, uh, our typical millimole per liter units. So up to nine would be our normal here and up to 150 would be normal for our creatinine. Um, he had never had an echocardiogram before, so we did do that um, to confirm our diagnosis and make some statements about severity. Um, and also, since he was collapsing, we were interested in whether he had pulmonary hypertension. We, of course, did thoracic radiographs, and he too stayed on some continuous ECG monitoring, um, but no arrhythmias were detected. So on his echocardiogram, again, we're saying, seeing many of the same things as we saw in Shatzi, in that we have this gnarly looking mitral valve um, with these kind of thick knob-like bits on it and, and the, the piece that kind of prolapses back into his enlarged left atrium is maybe a bit more prominent um, to the point that we actually had a few frames that we were concerned he had ruptured a little chordae tendinae. Um, so I don't know if, if you guys can appreciate this, but on this particular view of his thick mitral valve, every now and then you see a little echo bright speckle in the left atrium, where, right where my pointer is, and now I'll move it away. And it's also kind of flailing back into his left ventricle, so this echo bright thing that's kind of flailing back and forth. So we were concerned that he, he had ruptured a cord, and maybe that's why he had this kind of acute presentation. And then he, too, had, um, you know, a decently regurgitant valve, whoops, on his color, um, we see there. So the makings of myxomatous mitral valve disease, 
along with potentially rupture of his cord. And these guys typically have very exuberant contractility, um, or I should say exuberant um, e ejection, because they can eject into a very low pressure, low, I should say low resistance left atrium. They have a pop-off valve. So they can eject into a low resistance left atrium as well as a high resistance aorta. And so their wall motion um, to the eye anyway is, is typically very good. And then here's just a slightly different view of his very thickened and knobby and prolapsing, ugly looking mitral valve here. So our working diagnosis in terms of the underlying cause fit with, with his signalment and his presenting complaint, myxomatous mitral valve disease. And once again, we have, you know, a tall heart that's potentially wearing a backpack that um, has again this kind of caudodorsal distribution of, of increased opacity. If we compare this artery to this vein, we might say, well, it's maybe a little bit fatter, perhaps. And then if we look at our DV view, here's another dog that sort of likes to lateralize. So just because it lateralizes, don't think it can't be pulmonary edema. He likes the caudal left lobe too. He's got this increased opacity back here. Yes, he's abnormal here as well, but maybe not as much as back here. So we again have a stage C, myxomatous mitral valve disease patient. And he's collapsing too. And we think, by the way, that his, his cortal rupture has probably paid a, played a role here in him reaching stage C. He's azotemic. Is it pre-renal or is it renal? And sorry about that. We need to think about his syncope as well. Is he hypoxic just from again being congested? Is he having a vasovagal event? The interesting thing with him is his events were all preceded by coughing. So that act of coughing is definitely a vagal trigger. It can trigger uh, a surge of vagal tone and potentially uh, cause sudden onset peripheral vasodilation. Uh, or is he, is he hypoten was he hypotensive associated with the acute cortal rupture? You know, was, was his blood pressure low at those times because of that cortal rupture? Did he have an arrhythmia? Does he have pulmonary hypertension? Or is it some combination of these things? So that's the other thought. So if we work our way through this scheme with him, it's going to sound a little bit repetitious in the sense that, yeah, he's dyspneic, he's got pulmonary edema, so he's congested. In terms of perfusion, interestingly, once again, he was normotensive, good pulses, not hypothermic, bright and alert. And, and so the one here that becomes interesting, worsening renal function. Well, we don't actually know that it's worsening per se, or we don't know how long this dog's been azotemic like that. How long has his urea been like that? Does that actually mean that he has reduced perfusion from his heart disease? Not necessarily. Or we weren't ready to accept that just yet. So we still think he's kind of on the warm and wet side, and he needs diuresis that's more effective than what he's currently on. And so we chose to give him some intravenous furosemide, which he was naive to. He got a two milligram per kilogram dose every four hours for three doses. And then we backed off because we thought his respirate actually cleared up quite substantively within that time frame. He did get started on his PIMO, and we did continue his, his Fortacor once a day. We discontinued his thiazide. So while all of this was happening, we let that go, and he was on continuous ECG monitoring. So when we re-radiograph him, okay, we'll put them up side by side so it's maybe a little easier to see the effect. And we've got some improvement here, but it's maybe not as dramatic as our last case. You know, he's still uh, a little more opaque back here than I would like to see. He's still got some stuff going on back here and here. If we put them side by side, yes, it's less. You know, when we do the Sesame Street thing, which one of these is not like the other? But he's, he's definitely not normal looking. He still, by the way, had a sculptable crackles um, one day later. So he's not 100% normal in terms of his respiratory status. But 
If we look at some of his parameters, he lost a little bit of weight, so we did drop some volume. His rest rate came way down. His heart rate came down a bit. His mean arterial pressure was less, however, still very well within normal. But look what we did to his urea and creatinine. It went up, um, not surprising. His creatinine, it's still in the normal range, but it went up. And now his phosphorus is up too. Yikes. And guess what? He vomited once overnight, and he was inappetent in the morning. Wah, wah. Wasn't happy with that. <laughs> So, but this is, you know, this, this is common. You know, this is common. We're having a kind of, what's our priority here? Breathing um, or, or um, his renal parameters. And so now we, have to, now we have to kind of back up and say, okay, how, how are we now going to achieve these two things together? So if we reassess him now, he's still congested. Absolutely. He's radiographically congested. He has a sculptable crackles but his respirate is normal at rest, so it's not that bad. And he definitely has worsening of his renal function. So one of these out of this list, we're gonna call him lukewarm <laughs> and semi-wet. And apparently, so the, the physicians say that, that lukewarm and wet is actually one of the most common um, I guess assessments that they have in people. Most of them are lukewarm and wet. So that's where we're at. We're lukewarm and semi-wet. What the heck are we going to do about that? Well, we decided to completely discontinue his IV furosemide. We were going to go about the business of transitioning him to oral furosemide on an as-needed basis. We were going to wait until his rest rate was consistently above 30 and he was looking like he was trending back up. So we waited until um, we, we watched his respirate. So we held off. And when we were going to reinitiate his furosemide, we were going to give a lower dose. So he was getting 2 milligram per kilogram. He's a 6.6 .6 kilo dog. And so we were going to go to something like 10 milligram. We're very limited, obviously, with tablet sizes, unless we go to a liquid in, in the type of dose we can achieve. So we thought 10 milligrams twice a day at the most um, when his respirate starts to climb again. But we want to continue his pimabendan, and we want to continue his benazepril. So we chose to keep those going. Why? Because we want that positive inotropy and vasodilation on board to try to help to promote more forward flow. He needs better perfusion. He still needs diuresis, unfortunately, because he's wet, but we're going to try to really back off that and only give it when we think he absolutely needs it. What else did we do? We started some serenia. We made sure we checked his blood work for the fact that he did not have pancreatitis or something like that because he had a history of pancreatitis. So the rest of his chemistry was, was normal with the exception of those renal parameters. Um, we were going to alter his food offerings. So we were going to give him you know, the option of having small frequent meals that were things um, that maybe he hadn't been exposed to and we thought he might like. So some different canned foods. Um, we were going to really be aggressive about encouraging his drinking. Um, so we wanted to bring him to that bowl, offer it frequently, put treats in the bowl, put ice in the bowl, do whatever it takes to make him drink. Whoops. And so what happened? Oh, my gosh. Sorry. There we go. So what happens next? So that's, that's a day's worth of that. <coughs> We weren't going to get too crazy aggressive just yet. And let's see. So radiographically, I think he made still some gains, interestingly, a little bit better. Um, still maybe not normal, but a little bit better in that cotodorsal region. And we still have some stuff going on in some of these regions. So it's still not 100% normal. But, oh, sorry. Oh, my gosh. There we go. Oh. Now it's just got a mind of its own. I don't know what it's doing. We'll just do this. 
So comparatively, you know, we, we haven't made as big of a jump as we did the first two days. So less of a noticeable change, recognizing, yeah, we backed way off as diuretic. We haven't pruned him out from a central standpoint, though. So understand that. You know, it'd be one thing if we made him azotemic and he was a prune centrally. He's not a prune centrally. He's still, you know, got, got increased volume going on there. So what are his parameters doing now? Well, his rest rate had started to climb a little bit. His heart rate was fine. His mean arterial pressure was fine. We made small dents, I think, in his azotemia. So his urea, creatinine, and phosphorus all started to trend down. And that's just within you know, 18 to 24 hours. So that's just a very short time frame. So we were very, very hopeful that that trend was going to absolutely continue if we just kept our course. Why? He's not vomiting. He only had the one vomit. He's eating and drinking. He's bright and alert and, and, and no collapsing and such. So we thought, okay, this trend is hopefully going to continue. That is, things are going to start to come back down again. We still think God knows how long he's had, you know, some mild elevation in, in that urea. So what are we going to do? We're going to send him home on um, our plan. We actually did choose to increase his benazapril to twice a day, which for me is an optimized dose. We did not restart his thiazide. We were going to keep that off board. We were going to send him home with some serenia for a couple more days just in case, and then recheck him in a week. This little guy, he has just sailed. So we really have not altered his therapy in any way. His urea has continued to just come down. It's not normal. He still rides in the high teens. His creat's normal. He's eating, drinking fine, and his congestion is being kept at bay. Interestingly, on that lower dose of oral diuretic, his, his radiographs um, from that January 9th until the most recent ones, he's continuing to just clear slowly and looking pretty good, and he has not had any more, more sinkhole events, none. Um, so only associated with the collapse. So we kind of started to get into a little bit of trouble, but sometimes if we just back off and take things a little more conservatively and plug ahead with our, our maneuvers to promote more forward flow in a non-aggressive way, this was non-aggressive, um, we could get him straightened out. And I think we have to accept that, yeah, when we you know, do some aggressive maneuvers with diuresis, our urea and creatinine are going to go up. It's going to happen. And it's just a matter of whether it's, it's you know, pre-renal and acceptable um, or whether they have some pre-existing renal insufficiency that we don't know about. I did. Um, typically when I prescribe that, I usually do SIV dosing. Um, is that drug acceptable to be used for long-term baby dosing? Is it better to use it for I think that um, we routinely use it BID for our congestive heart failure patients. Um, we do. So um, I know the label dose, and you can the reps can correct me at the back. Anybody who's real familiar with the Fortacor product, but the label is is quite wide for a dose range: 0.25 to 0.5 once to twice a day. Am I right? Yeah. So it's a pretty wide dose range. That is on the label. Um, so it's within label dose. Um, the evidence, I think, to suggest that optimizing them um, fairly soon comes from a couple sources. One, um, there was some work done, I think, out of North Carolina, if I'm not mistaken, in Beagles, to suggest that the duration of action of minazapril is actually quite markedly less than 24 hour, and it's probably not too indifferent from enalapril. And so I think using it twice a day makes good sense, given the kinetics. And then... Um, there's oodles of evidence, I think, in people, too, with heart failure that going higher dose ACE inhibitor is, is the better way to go. So we do frequently try to optimize it to the higher dose within short order. <coughs> yep. <coughs> Questions? Okay, how are we doing, Fran? Pretty good. So we'll, we'll cruise through our last case here, and then... Um, Hopefully have time for more questions at the very end. So Sophie was a really interesting case. Here she is at home with her little bandana on. 
Um, so she presented to us in January um, with a presenting complaint of tachypnea, dyspnea, and an inability to settle or rest. And she also had a decreased appetite. We had seen her before, so just bringing you back. Um, we saw her for the first time in May of last year. She presented for much the same signs, actually, much the same signs. She was diagnosed at that time with congestive heart failure secondary to DCM. She was also um, diagnosed as being hypothyroid. Um, at that time, she actually spent time in our hospital. She was treated with some intravenous meds, and then she went home um, within fairly short order on um, pimavendan, benazapril, furosemide, and a thyroid supplement at a reduced dose, if you will. Um, during the course of her management, she developed atrial fibrillation. Um, interestingly, that did not result in worsening, appreciable worsening of her heart failure signs. It was rather incidental on a routine recheck that she'd flipped into atrial fibrillation. She was a bit on the tachycardic side, so we added diltiazem, a calcium channel blocker for her heart rate control. Um, and we had rechecked her. The, the most recent we had seen her was September, and she was doing great. And then she went back to her primary care veterinarian for follow-up subsequent to that and was doing wonderfully. Then late December, after Christmas, she presented to her primary care veterinarian with um, tachypnea, dyspnea, and an inability to settle. And um, they very appropriately tried working with her diuretic dose. So they went um, to three-time-a-day dosing. They also increased um, the, the individual doses. And that worked well for her for a few days. And then she kind of slid again and was markedly dyspneic and tachypneic, at which point she came back to us. Um, so on her physical, she's more of a 20-kilo girl. She was quiet and alert, pink. Um, Cap refill was just on the cusp of being a bit slow. Um, she had a 5 out of 6 left apex murmur, a 4 out of 6 on the right. She had an irregular rhythm, which fits with her having been in atrial fibrillation. And she had a gallop as well. On pulmonary auscultation, she had crackles bilaterally, dorsally. She had muffled lung sounds ventrally. She was tachypneic. Um, on abdominal palpation, she had cranial organomegaly, but she didn't have a palpable fluid wave. Her pulses were weak. She did have pulse deficits associated with that arrhythmia. Um, surprisingly, her blood pressure on, on an oscillometric method was normal. So initially, we did our quick analyzing tests. Um, her CO2 was kind of riding a little bit high on her venous blood gas. Surprisingly, her lactate was normal less than two. She was saturating fine on room air. Um, she did have atrial fibrillation still, which was not surprising. And her average heart rate was actually pretty darn good, um, 130 beats per minute. Um, and as, as I mentioned before, she was on rate control. Um, so here we have this yeah, irregular rhythm. Um, I know it's hard to appreciate because this is rather small, but um, a lack of, of identifiable P waves. So she was still in her atrial fib. Um, given that she had these muffled lung sounds ventrally, we did a, a focused point of care ultrasound, and she did have moderate pleural effusion. This was the first time that had been identified. Um, so that was a new dimension. She'd never had that before. Um, this is not her thoracocentesis, by the way. Um, that's my cheap web image. Um, so she had a thoracocentesis, and we removed 750 mils um, of a transparent yellow-tinged fluid. And on, on cytology, it was very unremarkable and deemed to be consistent with, with right heart failure. So we did do a CBC in chemistry, and it was actually reasonably unremarkable. Her CBC was totally normal, and the only thing on her chemistry was a mild increase in her ALT. Um, her urea and creatinine were well within normal limits. Um, she had had uh, an echocardiogram previously, um, but we were also just curious um, you know, what, what might have declined here. And, and how is that going to help us? And then, of course, we also did thoracic radiographs. So on her echo, we have this kind of markedly dilated left ventricle, markedly dilated left atrium. And 
Um, what we'll see on this view and, and the next one is that her wall motion relative to a patient with myxomatous mitral valve disease is, is substantively reduced. And her mitral valve is reasonably normal looking. You know, it's not that thick, knobby um, job that we've seen on the other echoes. It's these nice, thin leaflets um, that do not appear to have myxomatous changes. When we look at a, a short axis view, her wall motion, you know, relative to a, a mitral valve patient is substantively reduced, and particularly down here through her free wall, you know, this wall is, is not moving very well at all. Her septum moves better, and that's, there's a very good reason for that, which we will see. Um, a lot of these patients have mitral regurgitation just because they have a, a dilated mitral annulus, not because the valve itself is is uh, diseased, but you know, this is a substantive amount of mitral regurgitation. And, and that's our explanation often for why their, their septal motion can be quite a bit better than, than their free wall motion. And once again, if we look at her mitral valve, it was very normal looking. Just set that into motion again. Um, the other thing we noticed, her right side, it may be difficult to appreciate um, from, without having a, a normal for comparison, but her right ventricle and right atrium are, are very big as well compared to what we would normally see. And then this next image just shows us, if we, if we take a, a line and, and slice through her left ventricle, kind of along this axis, so a short axis slice through her left ventricle, this is her septum motion, so we can see its motion is kind of more, um, I guess pronounced than her free wall motion here, which is very poor. So her her total systolic function was quite poor. So her diagnosis is, is a wee bit different. Yikes! Yeah, this is post thoracocentesis. <laughs> um, so post thoracocentesis, we have quite a mess here. Um, so. I know it's difficult to make out what's heart and, and what's other soft tissue opacity, but suffice it to say, her heart is, is certainly all of that. Um, who knows how wide it is? I mean, I think it's, it's up here for the cranial aspect. I'm not sh exactly sure where the, the caudal aspect ends. Um, a lot of this uh, soft tissue opacity here, I, I suspect, is that big left atrium to the point of it looking like, you know, it's even impinging quite a bit on that bronchus there. And then her, her cotodorsal lung field, you know, and her cranial for that matter is, is just an absolute mess. Um, that's a dorsoventral view, again, quite a mess. Um, we really can't make out much in the way of cardiac silhouette. It's, it's astounding that she actually looked as good as she did walking in. Um, we can, we can sort of make out some vessel structures back here, but my gosh, we're losing them over here. And, and her airway, once again, is, is visible with just white on either side. So pretty marked pulmonary pathology there. So her diagnoses um, are, are dilated cardiomyopathy. That's what her morphologic diagnosis is. And she fits in the category of stage D because she comes to us on standard therapy and increasing doses of said standard therapy and, and is refractory to that. She's, she's horribly congested in the face of that. And she now also has evidence of biventricular failure. She, she's got signs of right-sided heart failure as well with that pleural effusion. So left and right heart failure, refractory to standard therapy. So we'll play our little quadrant game here with her, obviously congested. Um, she's got dyspnea and pulmonary edema, and she also has jugular venous distension, um, indicative of, of her right-sided failure. So yes, she's congested. Perfusion. Interestingly, in this list of things, if we just use this list, her blood pressure was normal, her temp was normal, she surprisingly was not lethargic or recumbent, her renal function was absolutely normal on, in terms of her blood work. Um, so all we really have here is, is a reduction in her pulse strength, which we would attribute, yes, to the fact that she has dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, so we don't have a whole lot of evidence of, of reduction in perfusion, although I should, probably where I should put this is somewhere in the middle. You know, she's maybe more of a, of a lukewarm girl. 
So if we play the game that obviously with all that congestion and normal re renal parameters, we want to diurese this dog, the question is how, because she's already on high doses of her oral. Um, and we know, yeah, she's, she's stage D, so she's refractory. So it may look very simple, but it's anything but simple. She's refractory to standard therapy so far. Oh my gosh, I can't stand this. Huh. There, okay. So what do we do with her? So we have to take into account the severity, the fact that she's stage D, um, and, and factor that into our decisions here. So she's not one that we're probably going to waste our time with the odd bolus here and there. She's been down that road last May, um, and, and we're not feeling tremendously confident that, that a couple of boluses is going to do the trick here. We need to be more aggressive. So we chose to put her on a constant rate infusion of 0.5 milligram per kilogram per hour of furosemide. We thought because, again, she's stage D, we have weak contractility, um, and you know, we, we, if, we, if we just do this maneuver alone, we might get ourselves in trouble. Um, we decided to add a low dose of intravenous dibutamine, which is our positive inotrope. We continued her oral pimo and her benazepril and her diltiazem. I had no reason not to continue those things. Interestingly, with that plan, there was really no change after 24 hours. If you put her radiographs up side by side, you would not be able to tell the difference. And she was minimally different um, clinically as well. So we chose um, to force ahead with, with a higher dose of a CRI for the next 12-hour chunk. We were going to be more aggressive with her diuretic, keep her positive inotrope going, and see where we could get with that. Well, <laughs> Still not looking that great. Day two, post-treatment, if we put them up side by side, okay, I don't know, maybe, maybe we're starting to see a little clearer back here. This view doesn't really do it for me. The next one might tell me a little bit more. I'll put them up side by side. Maybe things are starting to get a little better on this side. Definitely not as opaque. We're starting to see some lucency. We're starting to make out these vessels, actually. Can't see them here, but I can actually start to make out some vessels here. And this side is certainly looking better. So we're making some progress. So let's look at some of her parameters. Her rest rate's down. Her heart rate's still reasonably well controlled. And her marine pressures are pretty darn good. But check out what happens. We had a darn stinking normal urea and creatinine to begin with. Look at those. This is 24 hours, 24 hours. And her urea has jumped to 9.1, not a big jump. More concerning is this one. So from 74 to th uh, 317 for her creatinine. Her phosphorus has also taken a jump up above normal. Her lactate has taken a huge jump up and above normal. She's got a decreased appetite. Now she's lethargic and depressed. So, we really need to rethink this plan. Now what are we dealing with? We most definitely have still congestion. Her rest rate's still in the 40s. She wasn't reaccumulating pleural fluid quickly, which I guess was one bonus. But we've now, in addition to a reduced pulse strength, have a lethargic dog and most definitely evidence of worsening renal function. So that's a huge concern for perfusion. So she is absolutely cold and wet. And we need to do something dramatically different here to help her out. And her owners were, were so lovely and so willing for us to try to do that. So now we're thinking, OK, we need to be more aggressive with positive inotropy and vasodilation or one or the other. And diuresis at this point just does not seem like that great of an idea. So we did something pretty drastic. We actually discontinued her furosemide altogether for 24 hours. We initiated um, our potent arterial vasodilator, nitroprusside, and we uptitrated her actually to the maximum dose, which she tolerated. So we monitored her blood pressure continuously. And in the face of that weakened contractility, and with that potent vasodilator on board, 
her blood pressure stayed normal. So we were hopefully, either we weren't doing anything, or hopefully we were reducing her vascular resistance um, and maintaining normal blood pressure in the face of being able to improve her forward flow. We continued her dobutamine, and we actually increased the dose temporarily to five. So we really did thrust ahead with these maneuvers to try to improve her forward flow, warm her up. We continued her oral pimo, her benazepril, and her diltiazem because they'd been ongoing for, for long, and we didn't want to upset that. So now what does she look like? So this is now the following day. Yikes. We still got a lot of trouble. Um, again, this view I find potentially less informative. This is, most of this, by the way, is massive left atrium, most of that. Nevertheless, her lungs are still pretty ugly. So let's see here. So here's January 8, now January 9. So this is after about 24 hours of that last maneuver. You could argue this side looks worse in fact, with what we've done. Um, and this side, you know, I, I would have argued that actually I think I can see these vessels higher up now. I can see these vessels better than I could here. So I think she's gotten better on that side and worse on that side, if that's possible. But look what we did to her parameters. This is with only 24 hours of what we did. And... Yes, her respirate climbed a bit. Her heart rate was still good. In fact, it was even better. She had a really nice, calm heart rate. Her pressures, as I said, stayed wonderful, despite being on a potent vasodilator. Her urea and creatinine and phosphorus and lactate normalized ridiculously within 24 hours. She had an improved demeanor, and she was ravenous to eat. So what did we do? We thought, okay, let's take this and run with it. What can we do with the maneuvers that we've done to now just get small gains? If we can just make some smaller force steps forward instead of really big ones, because we don't want to upset what we have right now. Her lungs are better off than when she came in, um, and we've taken away that pleural fluid, um, but we still have a long way to go. So we cautiously weaned her off all of her CRIs, and transitioned her to oral medications over the course of the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. And we watched her really closely, knowing that, yeah, if she decompensates again, then that tells us, wow, we really don't have a manageable patient that we can get off IV drugs, and that's not going to obviously be compatible with any sort of quality of life. Um, but her owners really wanted to try to get her out of the hospital. So we were going to give it our best shot. So what did we transition her to orally? Well, we had some decisions here to make. We knew that more positive inotropy and more vasodilation might be the answer here to making these gains without upsetting that urea and creatinine again. So we increased her pimabendin actually to three times a day, going um, slightly beyond where we would normally go with dose. Um, we kept her, her um, vorticor going twice a day. Her furosemide, I mean, we had to, we had to pick something. Um, so I went with two milligrams per kilogram three times a day. Um, we initiated an oral arterial vasodilator. So in this transition period here of weaning her off the nitroprusside, we got an oral equivalent going. Um, we did decrease her thyroid supplement, and we thought we'd recheck her in a week. And so 48 hours after this maneuver, we actually did get her out of hospital. And one month later, we've got some progress. And I'll show you on her DV. We can actually see her heart now. And it's giant. So this is all heart. But in terms of her pulmonary edema, you know, we're actually miles ahead from where we were. We can see vessels back here now. She has not had reaccumulation of all that pleural fluid, surprisingly. So she's actually, uh, she was actually maintaining her own. And this lasted for about another, just until about two weeks ago, where she started to decline again from a quality of life perspective. And so I think that's, 
that's been an issue for for her owners and ultimately they they chose not to go forward beyond that there's a question yeah If they are in a setting of acute heart failure, then I will often do that, yes. And when we initiated her thyroid in the first place, we actually did so at half the dose and then just um, titrated it based on her total T4 level, levels and how she was doing clinically and how her heart function was doing. Um, so it's not uncommon for us to, to cut it back when they're in a, a really acute crisis. Yeah, because that's just going to drive up their metabolic rate and their metabolic oxygen demand and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so the, with her, on presentation, we had the oscillometric. What we were actually basing the rest of her pressures on, actually, though, was a direct art line because she was on nitroprusside. So yeah, I should mention that um, with, with nitroprusside, if at all possible, we need to be monitoring their pressures with a direct art line. So we, were, we had very good, obviously, um, confidence in, in those levels. In terms of Doppler versus oscillometric, that's a great question. Um, I think more frequently we, on our routine outpatients, we use Doppler. Um, I think I trust it more in cats and small dogs than I would in oscillometric. So I think for small patients, I prefer the Doppler. Big patients, um, I think the oscillometrics do, do fine. Um, as long as I'm getting matching of the heart rate, then I tend to, to trust those numbers. Yeah, but for her, we actually had an art line. Yep. What, sorry, that. what blood pressure did you cut off the Ah, yes, and that you might have missed that on a previous slide. Sorry, I might have gone through that quickly. So my parameters for uptitrating the nitroprusside are keeping her means above 70 and her systolics above 90. So as long as they are doing that, then I'm okay to keep up titrating and keep it going. As soon as those pressures fall below those parameters, we dial it back to the previously tolerated dose. Yeah. So I think, you know, obviously this is one that's quite a bit more complicated, but nevertheless, it's still brought in, you know, some of the oral therapies that we can use to actually continue to make progress in these patients. Um, and if, if we just focus, I think again, we focused on just some really simple clinical parameters in terms of monitoring these guys and trying to make some assessments of congestion and perfusion status and, and how we can help them out. And I thank you so much for your attention. I'm happy to entertain any questions. And this is just a little, a little place I call back home. Only right now, it looks like that. <laughs> My parents' driveway. <laughs> General recommendations for cats. That's a great question. So yes, I purposefully did not have a cat case in there, didn't I? <laughs> um, First of all, I mean, I, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Our canine caseload, at least in cardiology, is, is so profoundly higher than, than our feline caseload. It's, it's quite interesting. I'd actually be interested in knowing what your, uh, what your caseloads tend to be in, in canine versus feline cardiac cases, at least for the acute heart failures. For cats, I think the general thoughts are, are the following. So... I think we're very much more limited in some of the choices we have available to us to, to stabilize them. And so I think we're still talking simple things like oxygen, furosemide, nitroglycerin, hands off. So a lot of it still comes back to just very simple things that is probably nothing new. Um, I think where the difficulty is or where the challenges are is they, I find, are so much more sensitive to diuresis that we really need to be cautious with our doses and our frequencies. Um, so whether we're using boluses or CRIs, I'm always much more conservative. The other thing I find with cats is, unlike some of our dogs, and particularly some of our dogs that are coming in already on therapy, 
there are some cats, the ones that come in naive to therapy, that, that really don't need a whole lot to straighten them out. So again, I think sometimes being more conservative can be um, tremendously helpful, unless, of course, they're the ones that are presenting agonal and requiring intubation. And quite frankly, I'm not sure anybody can help them at that point. Um, uh, so, so diuresis, we have to be a lot more cautious. Um, the other thing that becomes challenging is the diagnosis. So I think we have a much greater comfort level with our canine patients as to what we're usually dealing with. Um, and they come to us maybe with more history than these kind of acutely presenting cats. We don't have access to immediate echocardiography for most of us. And when we do, um, you know, are they stable enough for us to do that? So we struggle with that <clears throat> because the types of cardiomyopathies they get are going to dictate so very much who should get a beta blocker versus who absolutely should not, who should get PIMO versus who absolutely should not. And in the absence of knowing that, I think it's, it becomes such a crapshoot that I'm more likely to just stay away from the things that could potentially do harm because I'm making guesses as to their diagnosis and just stick with the things that have the most potential to do good, gross my oxygen, sedation, nitroglycerin, and, um, you know, conservatism if possible. Um, and then once we stabilize them, get a diagnosis as quickly as we can. Um, you know, as soon as they're looking good, get them the heck out of hospital, get them home where hopefully they're going to be eating and drinking and feeling better. Um, and just try to be as conservative as we can with diuresis. And tapping chests, obviously, that's one of the things they like to do. So not being afraid to tap chests if we need to. Do you have any other specific, like, thoughts or questions or? No, I usually just, they come in this <laughs> if they're, yeah, if you're, if you're already in intubation and dump mode, I mean, it, it's still all the same things, but there is, there is nothing more you can do other than hope and time. Um, so, so for some of those guys, I think that's where the CRI of Lasix might be helpful. You know, if you want to get, a, first of all, I like to get a bolus on board nevertheless. Even if I'm going CRI, I always get a bolus on board first. Those are the ones that you might, might want to be immediately more aggressive. And that's, you know, sometimes as, as aggressive as you can be because we're not going to necessarily reach for other things that we don't know how that's going to interplay with their underlying disease. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I mean, su surprisingly, sometimes that can be helpful. Literally, you know, making them vertical and, and letting some of that fluid actually drip out, pour out. And we have, we have suction, so I don't know if any eMERGE clinics might have access to, to suction, but obviously gently um, using a suction tube down their trach tube. Um, yeah, so, and, and, and at that point, it really is just buying time to the point that they are stable enough that they can be extubated and breathe spontaneously and you're using gravity. It's nothing more than gravity. If, if they are not breathing spontaneously and or um, not oxygenating normally, then obviously, yes, we're using manual ventilation as well. Yep. In the guys right before that stage, where you want to do the hands off, <laughs> and they're going to freak out and try to die when you try to get an IV in them, yeah 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 I mean I think um, I think I am is probably more effective um, if we have to pick one then I'm sure they're perfusing their muscle better than they are their skin um, so yeah um, and and yeah, once again it's, you're working within your limitations of trying to balance risks and benefits and yeah, those are tough judgment calls, absolutely. But sometimes just a little bit of, um, you know, sedation and oxygen and, you know, getting a first one or two doses on board can be enough to get you that stability to get IV access. Yeah. Yeah. Strategies for that. This is why I'm not seeing them. They're all dying out there. 
oh, this is why I'm not seeing them. <laughs> Yeah, I think if your index of suspicion is high enough that it could be heart failure, I would. Yeah, I think there is, um, you know, obviously our, our, above all, we should do no harm, but I, I feel there is probably little harm that can come from one dose of furosemide in a distant cat where our index of suspicion as a clinician is that this could be heart failure. Absolutely give it, yeah. And, and I think radiographically, you know, we are just trying to heighten our skills of, you know, trying to differentiate what could be cardiogenic edema versus not by looking at heart size and pulmonary vasculature. Cats are notorious for having really big fat pulmonary vessels, I think, on, on their rads when they're in heart failure. So I really go looking for that. Um, the other thing that, that I, I think might be useful based on the literature, and, and I, I have to say I, I don't have a ton of... Um, uh, my own clinical experience to draw on, but I, I don't know if anybody's using BMP levels out there. And unfortunately, we don't have a rapid turnaround time on those. It's it's not a bedside test, so you're still looking at a 24-hour turnaround time. But the literature would suggest that differentiating cardiogenic from respiratory dyspnea in cats is one potential utility of that biomarker. Um, so that's a possibility. So a purple top tube and sending it off to IDEX as soon as possible for a BMP might be something that could help us um, in that scenario, at least until the point that we get a, a rapid bedside test. So I think radiography and, and maybe biomarkers are, are the best we're going to do. I still think, you know, biomarkers are, are intended to be used in conjunction with anything else, everything else. So they're never to be used in isolation, nor do I think most of us would use them that way. Um, pardon me? Low body temperature. Yeah, absolutely. So um, those cats do tend to be hypothermic. Um, that is a poor prognostic indicator, by the way, in terms of what are the prognostic indices for, for cats and heart failure. Um, and for thromboembolic disease, you know, it's potentially a poor prognostic indicator. As, as our criticalist, Dr. Bersanis, says, um, they they don't need to perfuse their asshole when they're in heart failure. <laughs> they generally divert blood flow from from the asshole. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's your drug that you use um, along with corticor, kind of like kind of like incontinence dogs? Different choice, but you're doing incontinence with the cardiac. Oh gosh, that's a good question. <coughs> You know, it's definitely not a scenario I'm commonly asked about. It, that is that I don't have to actively make that decision oftentimes to, okay, I am going to now put this patient on, um, on a drug for urinary incontinence. It's an alpha, yeah, it's, it's, it's a drug that can cause increased afterload, right, an increase in vasoconstriction. So um, I think, but there's also obviously downsides to some of the other choices, right? So I think... Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think it's it's really about judgment and what you're you know educating your client with all the pros and cons and 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 picking something that you think is is best. So agreeably, phenylpropanolamine by virtue of its potential vasoconstriction is not ideal, but to be honest, we have lots of dobes out there that have urinary incontinence that are on it. That are on it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And I think it's just the least amount possible as infrequently as possible. Yeah. Um, Dr. Katz, again, I'm just wondering about if, um, you know, you've got documented hypertension. I had one case like I was up against a wall and had to make a decision on. I had hypertension. I had. I'm sorry, hypo or hyper? Hyper. Hypertension. Okay. Um, I think in cats, reaching for amlodipine would be a very reasonable choice. In, in addition to the yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
And I think some people would even choose it before benazapril in terms of managing the hypertension. If we're talking, you know, the renal indications, that's a different story. But. Other questions? Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.